Um, so I'm going to talk about vision, blindness, and also a little bit towards the end about leadership. I want to really address three questions. Uh, what do we know about visual loss and blindness? And then what are the health policy challenges for eye health going forward? And then lastly, a bit about leadership and eye health. Uh, I, right at the beginning, I want to acknowledge all my colleagues in the Disability and Eye Health group, all the staff and students. This is a picture actually from a week ago. They're not all there, but at least a good number of them are there. And a lot of the information that I'll be sharing with you is their work. And I won't all the time kind of give credit to individuals. So please acknowledge that this is the work of a whole group here at the school. So to start with that first question, what do we know of blindness and visual impairment? So this is the epidemiology of the disease, and we're going to look at it from an epidemiological point of view. First define it, then measure it, its prevalence and magnitude, ask why does it occur, what are the reasons for it, the causes and risk factors. And all those questions are so that we can address the last question in a better way, and that is what are we going to do about it? How do we prevent and control visual loss and blindness. So first of all, we have to define it, and WHO give us four grades of visual loss, or vision, I should say. Um, normal vision is 618 or better. Moderate impairment is less than 618 to 660. Severe visual impairment less than 360. And blindness less than 360. So blindness, this level is kind of, you cannot see to walk alone. You have problems with mobility. This level, severe visual impairment, you'll have problems doing most jobs. So difficulty in working. And this level, 618, is, is a bit better than driving vision in the UK. So if you're at this level, you cannot drive, and it begins to affect your quality of life and function. And we measure vision with what's called visual acuity charts. Uh, you'll be familiar with these. And this is just to say that this one is the 618 line. This is the 660 line, which can be measured either at 6 metres or at 3 metres. So, quiz. I'm going to ask you in a few minutes how many blind people there are. I don't want any of the eye health masters shouting out the answer. I know the staff don't know, but I, don't, I expect the students to know. So I don't want anyone shouting out the answers, but I want you to think how many people are blind in the world, and then to answer the questions, true or false, is it more than the population of the UK? More than global deaths from cancer, true or false? More than the number of people with diabetes in the world? More than the number of doctors and nurses in the world, and more than the number of people infected with HIV in the world. So just have a think for a minute, and we'll come back to this when we've gone through the numbers. <coughs> so the way we get information on the prevalence and magnitude of visual loss is from population-based surveys, and when they are done, we get prevalence graphs like this showing that the prevalence of visual loss this is moderate and severe visual impairment in brown and blindness in blue goes up with age and quite dramatically and if you look at that at the age of 50 85 percent of all visual loss is in people over the age of 50. So the realisation of that led about 20, 25 years ago to the development of a survey methodology uh, tool called the Rapid Assessment of Avoidable Blindness, or RAB. With this tool, we survey a sample of people in a population who are age 50. Because it's in that age group, the prevalence is higher. Because the prevalence is higher, we can do a smaller sample which means the survey is much quicker and cheaper to do. And this RAB methodology was developed by ICH and is coordinated by staff in the department. And altogether, more than 300 of those RAB surveys have been done. And since 2004, 71 countries 
have got data on the situation of visual impairment and blindness in their country using that methodological tool. So we actually have a lot of data. And when we begin to analyse that data, this is looking at the number of blind people per million population, so it's prevalence, and it's got two, age, uh, two years, 1990 in red and 2015 in green, so 25 years apart. And as you can see, for all the different regions of the world, the prevalence in green has decreased over the last 25 years. And it's actually decreased globally by about 25%. If you also look, you will see that the prevalence in higher income parts of the world, higher income Latin America, is lower than in the Asian regions and tends to be lower than in Africa. So there's a relationship between the economic situation of a country and the prevalence of blindness. <clears throat> if we take that data and then map it over that 25-year period from 1990 to 2015, the magnitude of blindness, and this is millions of people blind from the vision loss expert group, has increased from 31 million to 36. So the answer to our question was 36 million people are blind. And this is to point out that there has been a decrease in prevalence by 25%, but an increase in overall magnitude by 15% because of global population increase. So the, the number per 100 has gone down, but because overall population has increased, the actual magnitude has decreased. It increased. And we'll come back to that again a bit later. So back to your quiz. The population of UK is 64 million. So UK is more than blindness. Global deaths from cancer is 8 million. So a lot more blindness than global deaths from cancer. Number of people with diabetes, 415 million is the estimate. So more than 10 times the amount of blind people in the world. This was quite interesting. Number of doctors and nurses, 10 million doctors, 21 million nurses. So if you put them together, that's less than the number of blind people. And the number of people infected with HIV is the same. It's 36 million. So our 36 million blind is the tip of the iceberg. It's the people who cannot, the, the vision is so bad they cannot see to walk by themselves. But below that is all those with moderate and severe visual impairment. It's about six times the amount of blindness, 200 plus million. So that the total altogether is a quarter of a billion people, 250 million out of a global population of 7.6 billion. So about 3.5% of the population globally have some form of visual impairment. <clears throat> so we're going to move on to causes of blindness and visual impairment. So here's your next quiz. The following cause more than 10% of all cases of visual impairment worldwide, true or false. Diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, cataract, trachoma, myopia. For the master students, this won't be in the exam, okay? <laughs> so this is the cause of blindness, 2015, 36 million in total, and this is the cause in order. So one third is cataract, and 21%, 20% is uncorrected refractive error. The majority of that is myopia. And then you've got glaucoma, macular degeneration, trachoma, diabetes, and everything else down here. If we do this, uh, so more than half of all blindness is cataract and the need for spectacles. If we do the same for visual impairment, all visual impairment, 
remember that's quarter of a billion people, 250 million people, then uncorrected refractive error is now the major cause, 50%, and cataract is second. So together they begin to be 75% of all visual loss in the world is due to those two conditions. So coming back to our question, there's only two that's more than 10%, cataract and myopia, and everything else is less than 10%. So what I want to do now, we've done an overview of defining blindness, the prevalence and magnitude, and a little bit about the causes, both blindness and visual impairment. And I now want to pick on two diseases, cataract and trachoma, to say a little bit more about them, and then we'll go on to the second question of the talk. So cataract is one third of all blindness, uh, but if we look at the UK or Europe, North America, people are not blind from cataract. So the question is, why are they blind? And in particular, why don't they get the services that they get here? We can't prevent cataract. There isn't a magic drop that will stop you getting cataract. But what we have is a very cost-effective intervention. It's an operation, but with that operation, people see the next day and they see very well. So it's a question of delivering that intervention, delivering the operation to people. And therefore, the key question is how many operations do we need to do to get rid of that 12 million people blind from cataract. And for that, we have two important statistics, the cataract surgical rate and the cataract surgical coverage. So first of all, here's our man who's got bilateral cataracts and he's blind. And to understand this question of how many do we need to do, I have to realise that every year in a population of, say, 1 million people, people develop cataract they enter the cataract can. They become a person in the population who cannot see with cataract, the cataract backlog. At the same time, we can deliver cataract services and they can get an operation and receive surgery. And modern surgery puts in an intraocular lens to replace the lens so that they can see very well. So if you look at that dynamics, uh, simple dynamics, you will see that if your operation circle is less than your incident circle, your backlog will increase. It will get bigger. Whereas if your operation circle here, the number you're doing each year, is more than the incidence each year, then the backlog is gradually going to disappear that line will move up and you will stop cataract blindness. So a key statistic is this number being done each year, and that's called the cataract surgical rate. The number of cataract operations per million population per year. These are the 2017 rates for different regions of the world. So in high income Central and East Europe, we have rates over 4,000 going up to 7,000. And in those countries, no cataract blindness, or negligible if it occurs. Then we move into Asia, where we're between 1,500 and 3,000. And in those countries, we have cataract blindness. Then we go to Latin America and the Caribbean, 1,500, cataract blindness and then into Africa with sub-Saharan Africa having rates of less than 500. So we can see from this that cataract surgical weight rate is a way of trying to encourage people to do more in order to move towards these rates which will end up with cataract blindness being eliminated. The second statistic we use is the coverage. So the rate is the number of operations each year. The coverage is at any one time, what proportion of the people with cataract have had surgery. So it's looking at 
this proportion, that of the total. How far up is the line? The higher it is, the smaller the backlog, the closer we are to eliminating cataract blindness. So the cataract surgical coverage is those operated divided by the backlog and those operated. And that statistic is easily found as part of the RAB survey methodology. So here's an example of that. This is from work of Jackie Ramka and Claire Gilbert in Nigeria. And these are cataract surgical coverages here. So this is the percent, 50% coverage. Half have been done, half are waiting. And one can see that for literate and illiterate populations, the coverage is lower in illiterate populations. That generally the coverage is lower in rural compared with urban. And for most situations, it is lower in women than in men, the exception being urban literate women in Nigeria. I always knew that West African women told their men what to do. And West African literate urban women go for surgery and get treated. So this is a way of identifying the risk factors for blindness. Remember, cataract is the major cause of blindness. And now we're looking at the services and how equitable they are and which groups in society we need to target. So in this situation, we need to target rural illiterate populations where the coverage is less than 10%. If we look at the whole of Nigeria, we might say the coverage is 40%. But in the rural illiterate population, less than 10%. And so we begin to develop interventions that will target those populations. And as you can see here, specifically interventions for women who overall have lower uh, cataract surgical coverage rates. <clears throat> so why do we do all this? So I've just kind of gone on now about what we do, what we do, all these numbers, statistics. But every so often it's quite useful just to sit, sit back and say, well, why? You know, wh why are we doing it? Blindness leads to poverty. And I don't just mean economic poverty. I mean blind children don't get educated. Blind adults don't get employed. They're not participating in society. They're beginning to be excluded. And their quality of life goes down. So it's not just kind of about diseases like cataract. It's much more about the life of individuals, their quality. And when they got a poor quality of life from a condition like cataract that takes a few pounds to have the intervention and takes 15 or 20 minutes to do, we have to ask ourselves, why isn't it being delivered? Why can't we get it to people? And of course, in this, poverty itself leads to diseases, which leads to more blindness. So you end up with a vicious cycle. So part of our group a few years ago, I think it's probably about eight or ten years ago now, looked at this question of, well, if we did the cataract surgery, what was the impact on people's lives? And this was a study done by Hannah Cooper, Sarah Pollock and other colleagues in three countries, Kenya, Bangladesh and Philippines. And they, through population-based surveys, took 600 people who had cataract that was causing visual impairment. They weren't all blind, but they were all at least moderately visually impaired. And they took 600 controls, age, gender, and village matched for the cases. And they measured quality of life. And what they found was a baseline in those with cataract, their quality of life was only a third or a quarter quality of life score of those who did not have cataract. So the cataract causing visual impairment, not blindness, visual impairment, was significantly affecting the quality of life. Then the question is, okay, if we do the operation, what happens? So they did the operation and one year later they went back and this was the quality of life score. One year later it was consistent for the three countries 
and you can see that it's gone up and is now, first of all, it's gone up from what it was significantly. It's now similar and equal to the control group, so they're back to normal vision, back to normal quality of life and productivity. They looked at many other parameters here, including an economic parameter, and demonstrated that the household economy also went up when the cataract intervention was done. So I want to move off from cataract now. Remember, that's the major cause of blindness and talk a little bit about trachoma, uh, which is the major infective cause of blindness. It's due to a bacteria called chlamydia trachomatis. It's repeated reinfections in childhood and children are reinfected because flies transmit the infection from one child to another in environments where there's very poor water and sanitation. That's the mechanism of it. These are the first signs, which are follicles in the inside of the upper eyelid. This will be probably a child of three or four. And the child keeps getting reinfected from siblings and friends. And the inflammation gets worse. And that can carry on for five or ten years throughout childhood. The, the, the uh, child has got this repeated reinfection with chlamydia. And then in adolescence and adults, it leads to scarring of the upper lid and if that scarring is severe the lashes will turn in trichiasis and they will scratch the front of the eye producing opacity of the cornea so this is the simplified classification of trachoma five signs active disease severe active disease scarring intern lashes and corneal opacity With that classification, one can go into communities and examine the community to see if the disease is there. And that's done in a very simple way. You randomly take 50 children aged 1 to 9 and you examine them for TF. And if the prevalence of TF is 10% or more, that community has endemic trachoma and requires a community intervention, which I'll come on to in a minute. So 50 children aged 1 to 9... If 5 out of 50, 10% have got TF, then that community has got endemic trachoma. So the world has to be mapped for trachoma. And you will see here that this keeps turning. So in 2010, they were the districts mapped. And gradually the districts have been more and more mapped till this is our map today. And that was a project to map 1,500 districts in 29 countries, coordinated by Anthony Solomon, who was a DTM and H student here and then did a PhD at the school and is now the head of the trachoma program at the World Health Organization. And with this map, we're now in a position to know where to go with the intervention for trachoma in order to eliminate it. And the aim is to eliminate this ideally by 2020, latest by 2025. So how do we do that? The programme is called SAFE, and SAFE stands for Surgery for the Trichiasis, Antibiotics, and that's azithromycin, given to whole districts where the disease is endemic, and then facial cleanliness and better water and sanitation to stop recurrence and transmission of the disease. So this is to stop the blindness that it, from disease 20 years ago. This is to stop the infection today. And this is to break transmission so that it won't come back. Estimated nearly 3 million people need trichiasis surgery and 190 million people need A, F and E. Because you do that in combination. You treat everyone with antibiotics, and at the same time, you do health education and water and sanitation. Work here at the school by Robin Bailey and David Maybe in the 1990s showed that one dose of azithromycin given to whole communities once a year would reduce transmission of the disease so that a programme 
of giving it to whole districts annually for three years was developed as the intervention for trachoma. That required the drug azithromycin and Pfizer, who make Zithromax azithromycin, agreed to a donation program which started in 1999 and today around 120 million people are getting that drug every year as part of trachoma control through mass drug administration. I want to emphasize it's not just the drug, it's also the F and E components as well. But the drug has enabled us to really break transmission uh, of the chlamydia trachomatis and therefore elimination of this disease is definitely possible in the next five to ten years. The last thing I want to mention is childhood blindness. Um, the number of children blind in the world is much smaller than adults. It's about 1.2 million. But the point is that they have 50 or 60 years of life ahead of them, which is different than for cataract, where you're talking of life expectancy maybe of 10 years. So the actual number of blind years from childhood blindness is almost equivalent to cataract and other things. So it's very important. The major avoidable causes of childhood blindness are retinopathy of prematurity, cataract in children, and vitamin A deficiency with measles leading to corneal ulcer and scarring. And this is the work of Claire Gilbert, in our, uh, my colleague in the department. This is the number of blind children per 10 million population. And these are the causes. So this is high income, middle income, low income, very low income. So if you look at the very low income and low income, you see corneal scarring from measles and vitamin A deficiency, traditional medicines, this child. That's where that occurs. If you look at cataract in particular, but also glaucoma in children, this is treatable, but in most parts of the world, it's not getting treated. It's only in the high income countries that the treatment services are available. And then lastly, this problem of retinopathy of prematurity, that's a problem of survival of very low birth weight infants. Therefore, it's a disease of high and middle income. And it's a disease that's emerging Latin America, Eastern Europe, but also now the cities of Asia and Africa. And this is an emerging problem. So, <clears throat> I've tried to address the first question, what do we know about vision loss? The major things, definition, magnitude, and a little bit about some of the causes. Now I want to talk about the health policy challenges for eye health going forward. The first one is the increasing ageing population. So in 2015, we have quarter of a billion people with visually impaired. If we project this forward to 2050, or well, to 2030, it will go to 400 million, and by 2050, 700 million. The reason for that is population growth from 7.3 billion to 9.7, 30% increase, but more importantly, a more than 100% increase in people over 60 and 250% increase in people over 80. And remember, uh, the diseases of visual loss are age-related. So as people live longer, we see more of those diseases. The second problem is this. This is, this is the people today with visual impairment. And this is a grouping or analysis of the diseases. The reason for doing it this way is Trachoma, onchocerciasis, vitamin A deficiency are diseases of the poorest people in the world. They're focal diseases. They're not everywhere. They're diseases of poverty, and they all start in childhood. The good news is that they all have very simple, cost-effective interventions. So we have azithromycin for trachoma. We have ivermectin for onchocerciasis. We have vitamin A and measles immunization for vitamin A deficiency. So these diseases can all be prevented through primary health care. You don't need an ophthalmologist, you don't need anyone specialised in it, and they're all diseases that can be eliminated and got rid of. 
with these cost-effective preventive interventions. And they're well on their way to doing that. If I was giving this talk 25 years ago, the whole emphasis would have been on these three. And today the trachoma is the one that's kind of really left, but that will disappear as well in the next decade. As they go, we move into cataract and refractive error. And as I showed you, that's half of blindness, three quarters of visual loss. Now these occur everywhere. They're not focal, they're everywhere in the world. The question is whether the services are delivered. Because here we have people who cannot see, and the intervention makes them see again. It's actually a very good news. And the intervention, by and large, is one time and curative. So the cataract operation makes you see. If you can't see because you need spectacles, you get spectacles, you realise you can see. Even if you break your spectacles, you'll go back and get another pair. So these are relatively easy to manage or to put services in place to deliver. Whereas when we move on to glaucoma and diabetes, if you're blind, we can't make you see again. What we can do is try and diagnose the disease early, give interventions that will stop you going blind or at least reduce the speed of you going blind. And therefore, screening programs now become important, together with long-term treatment interventions. Much more complex, much more difficult, requiring ophthalmologists and specialist centres. And then everything else is even worse. We, we, we don't even have public health strategies. It's just a question of having sophisticated eye care services. So thinking about the future and where we're going, we have this increasing complexity in delivering the services and the need for increased resources. So more specialised people, more specialised equipment, more cost. These are easy. This is relatively easy. We still haven't done it, but they're relatively easy. But as these disappear, it will get more and more difficult. The third problem is this or the third challenge for health policy is this. This is a map of the world resized according to the number of blind. So America and Europe are thin, and Africa, India and China are fat, because that's the number of blind people. This now is resized according to the number of ophthalmologists. So... Americas and Europe are now fat, and Africa is very thin. So to put this another way, the proportion of blindness to ophthalmologists is extremely high in Africa compared to other parts of the world. And when we look at the minimum required per million population, and this is the minimum for ophthalmologists, none of the different language-speaking groups of Africa come close to meeting the minimum. The UK, by the way, is 20. India and China are both 15 per million. So it's Africa that is really kind of way behind in having the eye health personnel to address the problem of visual loss and blindness. So our three challenges are more elderly people, therefore more visual loss. Going from the easy green to the not so difficult one-term treatment, one-time treatment cataract, to the much more difficult glaucoma and diabetes and then everything else that follows. So more complexity for the treatment of non-communicable eye diseases. And then lastly, inequitable distribution of already inadequate resources. So most of the ophthalmologists we have are in cities and not necessarily where a lot of the population are. And for Africa overall, we've not even, we're, we're about 50% of the minimum requirement of ophthalmologists. So that's kind of a bit depressing, isn't it? So we better have a bit of kind of positive news, things that might be happening and so on. So first of all, a bit of good news is cataract services together with spectacles, are financially sustainable. These are statistics from a hospital in India 
show in the number of cataract operations and about two thirds are done at no charge because those that pay subsidise free treatment. And that's just for cataract. If you begin to take income from spectacles as well, then you can really fund an eye care service. It's not a problem to generate money from cataract and spectacles to fully run an eye care programme. It, it just requires management. That's why so many private providers want to get into ophthalmology and eye care, because there's money to be made in it. The second thing is, because a lot of it is repetitive refractions and different procedures and so on, non-doctors can be trained to do technical and surgical procedures. So this has been pioneered in Africa. You have nurses and assistants doing cataract surgery. And there's no reason, I think, in the future why they can't be doing laser treatment for diabetes and refractions and so on and so on. So the idea of task sharing and task shifting and training people for specific jobs, particularly where it is a repetitive um, technical procedure. And then lastly, the idea of M Health and information technology. Uh, this is, some of you may have seen this, the portable eye examination kit using mobile phone technology to deliver eye care in remote areas. This has been pioneered by Andrew Basteras here at the school. Uh, and this is a way of enabling ICA to really reach into rural areas. I'm now going to talk about a few things that, uh, that we've kind of gone further on here in our group, particularly to address this question of insufficient eye health people for Africa. Uh, Matthew Burton and Nick Asprey in our group uh, have a programme called the Commonwealth Eye Health Consortium. This is a Commonwealth programme funded by the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust. It's got several strands to it, but one of them is the training of fellowships in clinical ophthalmology. So these are centres around the Commonwealth, Canada, South Africa, India, uh, Bangladesh here, Malaysia, New Zealand, Australia and an exchange of fellowship and training programme. Took about three hours to do that. <laughs> so the idea of not only north to south training, but south to south training. In particular, oh, sorry. In particular, people from Africa going to India, right, to see how services are delivered there and then to go back with that knowledge and expertise and begin to put it into practice back in Africa. So the original idea was to train 100 people, already 92 have finished, 23 are actually in their fellowships now, and 30 more are waiting to go. And there's been other, that's just one example, but many other examples like this. The second thing is, uh, and this was started, I think 12, 15 years ago, by Marcia Zondervan is a health partnership program whereby health departments in the UK are matched with health departments in Africa in order to improve the quality and quantity of eye care training. And many of these partnerships are now eight and ten years old. These are all the different ones down here. And this is a kind of twinning that is beneficial to both sides. People in the UK like to go and it's meaningful for them and they get motivated and they can pass on their skills and expertise and help with training for the centres in Africa where there's often insufficient faculty. But it's very organised. They have three-year action plans uh, with clear objectives and that's all coordinated by Marcia. And then lastly, uh, one of the things that was started actually 30 years ago now had its 100th issue centenary last week, is the Community Eye Health Journal. This is done four times a year, it's free. Each issue addresses a specific health topic. So you know, one issue will be on trachoma, and the next one will be on retinopathy of prematurity, and so on. And it's translated into different editions, it's also online, and the paper copy goes to about 30,000 people in order to keep people up to date 
and to keep the information out there to try and improve the delivery of eye care. So in summary, we've done the first two questions. 2015, 36 million blind, quarter of a billion visually impaired, 75% of visual impairment <coughs> is treatable, it's cataract or refractive error. Trachoma, onco and vitamin A are in the poorest parts of the world and they're still there, but they are disappearing. Visual loss from diabetes, glaucoma and ROP is increasing as we have an ageing population and are much more difficult to deal with. The population of the world is ageing and this is going to be a challenge for the next generations. And there is a severe shortage of eye-trained personnel in Africa and that is a major limitation to improving the eye health of people in Africa. So that takes me on to the last thing, which is leadership. Apparently this was a cartoon for President Trump. So can you name these leaders? First one? Yeah. David Beckham. Somebody's a Manchester United fan. Yeah, yeah. More difficult. Uh, yeah, who's uh, I knew somebody had come from India. Yeah. <laughs> this is Sach Sachin Tendulkar, yeah. the Indian cricketer. <laughs> who's that? <laughs> Winston Churchill? Yep. <laughs> who's that? Idi Amin. Malala Yusuf. And Gandhi. You see, they're all leaders. When we use the word leadership, in our mind, we have a positive connotation. But not all leadership is good. In fact, there's a, a lot of very bad leadership in the world. And when we look at those pictures there, you may you know, clearly say that person's good and that's bad, and there's some that you might kind of say, well, I don't really know or I'm not sure. So the type of leadership depends upon your vision and your values. What sort of world do you want? And how are you going to behave and in your behaviour, lead, so that people will follow that. So if your values are bad, and you have that type of behaviour, yes, yeah, some people will follow you, and they'll have that type of behaviour as well. And we know that in many parts of the world today. So what's important for us in health and in public health is to understand what our role in leadership might be, but also what example we're going to give. I want to talk about this man, it'll only take about five minutes, and it's just an example. There could be many, many that I could talk about. But I'll talk about this man. His name's Dr. V. Some of you will know him, particularly if you come from India. He was born in an Indian village, poor family, in 1918. He qualified in medicine, 1944. He was then conscripted in the Indian Army for three years. And while in the Army, he developed rheumatoid arthritis and was actually bedridden for two years with rheumatoid arthritis, and then ending up with very deformed hands from rheumatoid arthritis. When he finally, when it kind of, the disease went into quiescence, he had been doing obstetrics, but decided to change and go into ophthalmology. And he trained in ophthalmology despite having these very deformed hands and taught himself how to operate. He even designed special instruments which he could use. So he trained in ophthalmology and he qualified in 1954 in India and he was appointed a government ophthalmologist in Tamil Nadu state and he served there for 21 years training many other young Indian ophthalmologists. And then he retired in 1976, age 58. 
to do what? After he retired, he decided he wanted to start an eye clinic for poor people. His vision was that no poor man in India or woman with cataract should remain blind with cataract when it's treatable. That was his vision. Why should poverty make you blind? So he wanted to provide free cataract surgery to people who were blind. So he went to a bank, he went to several banks and asked for a loan to buy a house where he could set up a clinic, private clinic, but with the purpose to treat poor blind people. And he was told, you're too old, remember he's got these deformed hands as well, and poor people won't pay, so there's no, it's not going to work. So he sold and mortgaged his own possessions and he bought a small house and he put 12 beds in it and in 1978, age 60, he started. Impressed? I think it takes something, you know, I mean, I'm kind of gone past that, but it, as you get older, you know, you just want to sit down and watch telly. <laughs> And he'd been 20 odd years in government service, he'd trained all these people. Why not just go and sit down and relax now with your pension? And remember, he actually goes and sells what he's got in order to do this. So he started in 1978 and he did 2,000 operations. Half the people paid and half was free. So he was taking a bit from the rich to subsidise the poor. Within 10 years, he's doing 30,000 cataract operations a year. That's the first 10 years. 10 years later, 150,000. 20 years later, 300,000. Last year, they did nearly 500,000 operations. He himself died in 2006, around this time. But the work kind of carries on. This is now the largest eye hospital in the world. Does more work than anywhere else. They've now got 12 centres around the state of Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu is a bit more than the UK. And these centres do as many cataract operations as the whole of the UK. Everything that we do. Started by one man, age 60, who had a vision. I'm going to listen to a, a clip of him before he died. It's, it's quite short, it's only a minute or so. He's very difficult to understand. He was not a man who stands up and speaks and, you know, gets everyone to kind of follow him. He was a very gentle, quiet, humble man, and you'll see from this. But listen to his words, and the words will come up on the screen if you can't hear it. You may also catch a glimpse, a glimpse of his hands. Suddenly he turned around and then you see he seemed to contact his inner being. You seem to be one with him. But here is a soul which has got all the simplicity of confidence. Doctor, whatever you say, I accept it. An implicit faith in you. And then you respond it. Here is an old lady who has got so much of faith in me. I must do my best for her. Now how am I going to train myself to do perfection? When we grow in spiritual consciousness, we are into ourselves with all that is in the world, so there is no exploitation. It is ourselves we are helping, it is ourselves we are giving. I like those two lines, how will I train myself in perfection? And then he goes on, it's us, it's, it's those that we're helping, it's, it's ourselves that we're healing in what we're doing. So thinking about this man and just trying to kind of learn from him, you know, what was it about him? I want to put to you three things. First of all, 
he had a passion for what was right. You can have a passion for anything, right? This was a passion for what was right. It was based upon his vision and his values. And he didn't lose sight of that. Right? The vision was every blind cataract person in India should be able to get an operation, whether they can afford it or not. That was his vision. And then his values was to make that happen. So the vision and the values are the kind of foundation. The second was, he did it by example. He sold his own things, he started it himself. Others came round, and of course to get to those numbers, there's many, many others, but they've all been following his example. He led by example, he didn't tell others what to do. Right? He started by demonstrating himself what to do. And then others began to say, I want to be part of this. And he had lots of challenges. Lots of people said, you can't do it. You know, we've never done it this way. We've always done it some other way. Ever heard that? Right? You can't do it like that. That's not our way. You have to challenge the status quo to bring about the change. And that's what he did. He has a famous, he was the one who did the thing of, why don't we take money from those who can pay to subsidise the poor? Very obvious when you think about it. But it was a new, new idea. He challenged the status quo that the cost of surgery is this and that's what you have to pay, whether you can afford it or not. He also had a, a line which was, I'm not sure I totally agree with this, but it's an, he said, cataract surgery should be like McDonald's. Right? Wherever you go in the world, there's a McDonald's and you know what you will get, the quality is the same. Not necessarily great, but the quality is the same. You know what you get, and it's affordable. And he said cataract surgery should be like that. Like we should deliver this quality product at a low cost everywhere in the world. And most importantly, I, if you're a leader, the issue is, are people following you? And he didn't go out to kind of create a fellowship. It was his example. And as people began to come alongside him, he enabled them to take over. He encouraged them in what they were doing so that they were ready to follow him. Remember, there are 500,000 now, and this is more than 10 years after he died. It wasn't just about him. It was his vision, but then modelling the way and encouraging others. So, last slide. We, we've talked about what we do in blindness. I've talked about the diseases and, and everything and so on. But actually what I more want to leave you with is the why. Why do we do it? And in our public health, we can get caught up with papers and grants and status and workshops and presentations and so on. Right? That's the what. But what we have to do, if we really want to see changes in the world, is to keep the vision in front of why we do it. Why are we in international health? Why are we trying to do these things? We want to improve the quality of life and the quality of health of people less fortunate than ourselves. And we have to keep that at the forefront. We have to keep the end Right, the vision in front of us. The means to that end is grants and papers and everything else that we do. But it's the means, not the end in itself. So to keep the vision and the values at the forefront. Like Charlie Brown said, there is no heavier burden than a great potential. I can imagine a lot of you here have a great potential. And in case you're feeling that that's a heavy burden, I'll leave you with the words of Mother Teresa. Not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. Keep the vision and the values at the forefront. Thank you.